it's 9 a.m. where we are, and it's the fourth day of our conference, and some of us on this stage are going to be a little tired, and we'll have Bill McKibben with us from the East Coast, where it's noon, and he's going to be all fresh and able to make us look really bad. But um, I want to first invite the rest of the panel onto the stage with me. Uh, first, we have Robert Gomez, who is an artist and activist and working in uh, areas that you will hear about in a moment. And then Donna Morton from Princip Principum, Princip Principium, Principium, I knew I was going to get that wrong, and Primal Shaw, who's the president of Kiva. And um, my copy editor, copy editor daughter is sitting in the stage, and I am embarrassed that uh, we had something happen that I wasn't really thrilled about, and that was the name of this title is What is Literally Worth Dying For? And I don't think we're talking about literally dying, but maybe in <laughs> some ways we are. And I think we're going to explore that because what does it mean and what does it look like when we make choices that we are not that are not in line with the culture around us and what do we have to give up and what parts of ourselves might be dying. So we're gonna, we're gonna work with that dying phrase anyway. So the panel's gonna go like this. Uh, Bill's with us via Skype and we're not a, always 100% certain that Skype is gonna work. So we're gonna start with Bill and make sure we get to hear from him. And the, the que some of the questions we're gonna be talking about is, you know, when, when did you know your life was going to be different, that it wasn't, you weren't going to grow up to be the banker that your father wanted you to be or the homemaker that your mother wanted you to be or whatever culture was telling you? And then, you know, how is that playing itself out in your life that, today? And so we're going to start with Bill and ask him to take about 10 minutes to talk to us about, about some of those things. For those of you who don't know Bill McKibben's work, and I can't imagine that there's anyone in the room that doesn't, uh, he is the founder of 350.org, and he is the, the, the chief climate activist, I think, in the world. And he's been arrested multiple times and has been getting all of his friends to be arrested with him, fighting uh, for the things he believes in. So, Bill, welcome, and we're so glad. We see him right down there, so that's why you'll watch it, see us all looking that way. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Welcome wow. to SOCAP. <laughs> Very good to be with you all. I wish I was there in person, um, but it's very nice to be joining you via low-carbon Skype anyway. Um, look, uh, I, I'm glad to hear that we're, we're not talking about literally dying for anything on this panel, because I, you know, uh, I think the work that most of us do, certainly the work we do at 350, is just the opposite. Our hope is to uh, stop people from dying. Mm. Um, the estimate at the moment is that about 200,000 people a year die from the effects of climate change. Uh, the most recent study indicated that by 2030, there'd be about 100 million deaths due to the effects of fossil fuel on this planet. Um, that's why we fight hard against the fossil fuel industry. It's why we're so happy to see this quickly spreading divestment movement around the country and around the world. Um, it's why we do what we do. Let me talk a little bit, maybe a way to talk about it a little bit was, is just to um, reflect a little bit on uh, the experience of writing a letter asking people to come to Washington to get arrested, which I, you know, I, I wrote that letter about two years ago, a little more, and I'd never written a letter like it, and it was a little hard to do, as you can imagine. Um, I wrote it, and then a bunch of my friends and colleagues sort of edited it and signed on. People like Naomi Klein or Wendell Berry or Danny Glover, uh, 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 leaders all across the continent. And we were asking people to come because it was the first, the beginning of this fight against this Keystone XL pipeline down out of the tar sands of Canada. Though it's since become one of the biggest, the iconic environmental fight of our time. Two years ago, no one had ever heard of it. So we figured that civil disobedience would be important for the role that it often plays to draw attention to something and to underline the kind of moral seriousness of it. Um, 
and and uh, that's why we ask people to come and be arrested. But asking people to be arrested is hard. And I not only wrote the letter, but I was there every morning for those two weeks, except for the three days I was in jail myself, um, talking to people before they went off to get arrested, giving a little talk and just saying, what you're going to about to do is brave because, uh, you know, we're all raised to when the police tell us to do something, to, to do it. Um, that's what feels <laughs> right for, you know, just sort of, uh, sort of middle-class uh, 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 Americans um, um, whose experiences with the police have mostly been good, and so on and so forth. It's psychologically hard to, to not do what you're told to do. Um, um, and it was very moving to see people um, acting bravely in that way. I mean, it wasn't as if they were going off to the, none of us were going off to, you know, the front in World War II or something. We weren't going to die. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, spending three days in jail in central cell block in D.C. is about as much fun as it sounds like it would be, you know. Um, 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 on the other hand, it's not the end of the world. The end of the world is the end of the world, which is why we do what we do. The two things that I reflect on when I think back on that initial letter that we wrote that seemed important to me were, one, we didn't think that young people should have to be the cannon fodder for this. College kids have led the climate fight, young people all over the world. Um, but, you know, it's a little harder right now in our economy if you're 22. Um, maybe an arrest record not the best thing for your resume, you know? Um, one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is... Uh, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? And, um, and so it was with um, pleasure that we watched people arrive there um, who, you know, had hairlines like mine. Um, we didn't ask people, how old are you, when they got arrested, that'd be rude. But we did ask, I think cleverly, who was president when you were born? And the two <laughs> biggest... The, the two biggest cohorts came from the FDR and the Truman administrations. On the last day, there was a fellow arrested with a sign around his neck that said, a World War II veteran handle with care. And he was so old that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration. Wow. I studied American history, and I'd forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Um, um, it was very good to see elders acting like elders. Um, doing the doing the work that they should be doing, and it was very moving for the young people who were doing all the organizing of all of this uh, to watch uh, uh, older people being willing to play their part. The other thing we asked that was interesting was um, that everybody, if they'd come, would they please to get arrested, put on a necktie, or wear a dress? And you can tell from looking at me that that's not my normal attire. I live in Vermont. We don't really, um, you know, neckties are for funerals, and that's about it. Um, but there was a point we wanted to make. And the point was, and I think this is an important point, and one I, get a, I want to get across in the context of this panel, I don't think there's a darn thing radical about what we're doing. Um, I think all we're doing in our movement is asking for a world that works the way it was when we were born, you know, a world that works the way it's worked for the last 10,000 years. I, I, I don't think anybody in, you know, sort of across sort of social movements is asking for very much in the way that's radical. I think people at Occupy, who are supposedly our, you know, most radical movement or whatever, are just, you know, for the most part saying, we want the country to work sort of the way it was said it did in high school civics textbooks, you know, not a world where uh, a, a few people, because they're rich, get to control everything. Um, I don't think in any way that we're radicals. I think radicals work at oil companies. Uh, I think that if you're willing to make a fortune, and the fossil fuel industry makes more money than any industry there's ever been, if you're willing to make that fortune by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, and if you're willing to do it after scientists have explained what the consequences will be, and if you're willing to do it after, as with last summer, we watched the Arctic melt, we've lost 80% of the sea ice in the Arctic, if you're willing to do all those things, then you are an incredible radical. Um, you're, you may not be willing to die, but you're, um, you're 
clearly willing to kill for your uh, beliefs and your fortune and things. Mm. And, and so standing up to that kind of radicalism seems to me like our task. So it doesn't, none of it seems to me, it doesn't feel the work that we're about extraordinary in, in any way, really. What seems extraordinary is that there are people on, uh, uh, who aren't, you know, sort of involved in it. There, there are still people willing to invest money in Exxon, you know, willing to profit from the wreckage of the climate. That seems to me extraordinary and strange and, and, and a little hard to understand. And we're doing our best to kind of spread the information to make sure that they um, um, understand it so that they'll hopefully stop doing it. You may think I'm just a, um, uh, a hopelessly um, uh, a normal human being. And that's <laughs> actually what it, what it feels like to me. Um, um, and, I, and, and, and one of the good things, and I'll just finish here, it, is to say that the, the movement that we're building, this climate movement, which has really sprung up in the last five or six years around the world, is a beautifully diverse, spread out and sprawling movement without a bunch of leaders. Uh, it's not exactly leaderless. It's more like it's leaderful. And there are um, uh, tens of thousands of people all over the country and all over the world who have sort of shown up to provide the motivation and the impetus and the leadership. It's very open source would be one way to describe it. And another would be to say that, you know, it, the, the, the movement that we're building mirrors the, um, well, mirrors the system we'd like to see. Our hope for the future is not a few big power plants, but uh, uh, 10 million solar panels on 10 million roofs all interconnected. And that's how we like our politics too. Um, our movement to be. And I, for that reason, it's a very innovative, interesting time. And hopefully all of us can do uh, parts of this and none of us will have to, um, uh, you know, go die for it. It's absurd. I mean, it's absurd that we even have to go to jail for it. Uh, you, know, that, you know, I mean, in a rational system, it would be enough for scientists to say, look, the worst thing that ever happened in the world is in the process of happening. Here's what you need to do, you know, uh, put a price on carbon, let markets work, spur the development of renewables, let's get down to it, whatever. I mean, you know, if, if our system was working successfully, that would be more than enough to get us going in the right direction. And, and, it, and it, once in a while, annoys me that, I mean, I don't mind having to go off to jail myself, but it does piss me off sometimes to watch, like, um, I remember watching Jim Hansen, our greatest climatologist, climb into the paddy wagon for the third or fourth time, you know, in the last few years. It's like, you know, really, this guy is a great scientist. He should be in his lab, hard at work, figuring out what's going on. It's pathetic that, you know, uh, 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 our system is so dominated by wealth and power that this guy has to go to jail in order to get people to pay attention to what he's saying. So that's all I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And I, I really love the way he's refocused this question rather than we're up here to talk to these wonderful people who are somehow living outside of what people think should be happening. We've got some folks on this stage who are doing great stuff, and they're, unfortunately, we don't have thousands, we have 1,900 people here at SOCAP, Bill. I thought you'd love to know that, but, but we don't have 20,000 people. It's still, we still got some work to do, but I'd love to, to start with you, Premal, about when was it in your life that you kind of realized you were going to see things differently than maybe the other, some other folks around you. And I've heard this story before, and I, I'm anxious for our friends to hear about. Well, you know, I just want to pick up on what Bill said around what we define as absurd. Um, and I think a, a really interesting question that uh, I recently heard is, what do you want to make absurd in your lifetime? Mm. Um, so if you think about it, uh, you know, 20 years ago, if you're on a flight, uh, the flight, people would be smoking on a flight. Uh, you'd be in a restaurant right here in San Francisco, people would be smoking in a restaurant. And now, if that were to happen, that's absurd to us. The culture has completely shifted, laws have yep. shifted, so on and so forth. And so in one generation, something like that can go from common to uncommon or absurd. And the idea of going to jail 
in order to make sure that our children and our grandchildren inherit a planet that's viable, uh, that's absurd. Um, and another thing that's absurd is poverty today. Uh, uh, I just read that 16% of Americans are below the poverty line. And we know that 3 billion people on the planet live on less than $2 a day. My family um, was lucky enough, my parents were lucky enough to have an education in India that when I was a year old, I was born in India, I was able to immigrate to the United States. And I lived in the suburbs of Minneapolis. And uh, when I was five years old, my parents took me back to India for the first time to visit my grandparents. And, um, you know, I'll never forget the love that I felt. I was, got to sit in between a uh, moped, uh, between my uncle and my dad, honked the horn a lot. Um, it was, uh, I got to eat ice cream every day, which was uncharacteristic of my mom on that trip, you know. Um, <laughs> it was a wonderful trip, but at, at five, I think the thing I could not grok, and I still can't wrap my head around today, is just how different it was from the neighborhood that I was raised in, in New Brighton, Minnesota. The village that my dad lives in, or that he was born and raised in, and the, the, the town that I was raised in um, was completely different. And the thing that I think is most different is access to opportunity, access to that social mobility, the ability to become a part of the middle class. And um, one, one particular story on, one of the first days when I was there, my mom let me hold on to a one rupee coin and we were walking through the marketplace she wanted to go shop for a few things and there's sewage stream running right through my dad's village um, and I dropped the coin and my mom you know immediately yanked me in the other direction because she didn't want me to pick it up because it was dirty to her and I remember looking back and a woman who was older than my mom in a ragged sari she must have been a beggar in the marketplace she had walked over picked up that one rupee coin looked up at the sky, and then thanked God that she had found it and tucked it away in her blouse, in her sorry blouse. And what my mom was willing, and my mom's amazing, but she was willing to literally throw something away, that same thing could answer someone else's prayers. This is the disparity that we have on the planet today, and that is absolutely absurd to me. So I think at that that first trip back, and travel can open our eyes, um, travel back home can open our eyes, that, that um, I think probably changed the set of decisions that I made, uh, because I knew I wanted to do something about that feeling that I had, but I didn't know what that was, and you know, um, it's been a complete privilege to have uh, uh, been a part of Kiva. Thank, thank you, Premal. I may have to ask Bjorn to bring tissues up here before this is over. I'm gonna, the, t I feel like the tears are going to be flowing. Donna Morton, my friend who I met a few years ago at the Unreasonable Institute when she was working with launching First Nation Power, First Power, um, and now is off into a new venture. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started on this somewhat countercultural road that you're on, that we want to make cultural? Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking about the question, and, and I realized that, you know, um, I was made in many ways, and I'll talk about that too, but there's also a way, um, people are going to make fun of me, but in the immortal words of Lady Gaga, that I was born this way. <laughs> I, I was a little girl um, who became aware that a lake that I loved was dead, um, and was kind of sort of thrust into the environmental movement with some help from John Denver, pop songs, because I grew up in a working class family. So a lot of my education came from television and movies um, and, and other forms of popular culture. And I realized I was sort of collecting um, information about poverty, collecting information about, you know, um, I, I feel like I heard future generations as a child. I mean, I didn't hear voices, but I, I, mm. I felt as a child an awareness of myself as an old woman and that I've known all my life that I wanted to die at peace and that the way to do that was to wow. stay awake and stay aware. Um, so I, I kind of came out of the world like this. Um, and then I've been really fortunate to find mentors along my path. 
Um, you know, one of the first mentors that really shaped me in some really profound ways was a guy named Joel Solomon. Lots of you probably know Joel Solomon from Renewal. Um, well, you know, Joel Solomon kind of picked me up as an angry street activist in my early 20s. I, um, like my colleague Bill McKibben, went to jail a lot in my 20s. I went to jail every five weeks for two years of my life, actually. Wow. Um, and it was, my, it was my journey. It was my journey through no, um, using my body, using everything I had to say no to the absolute atrocities. I started out as an anti-nuclear activist, fought against toxins, fought against oil companies, fought against the capture of whales, you name it, I was arrested for it. Um, and then, you know, I started telling Joel that I was, I was, I was in pain because there was something else happening inside me. I wanted to say yes. I had this spiritual longing to be able to lean in and really say yes. And, you know, Joel said, you should come into the social venture network world. You should learn about these really awesome business people, financial people that are reinventing the world, and maybe you'll find kind of your next path. And that really happened. And then, you know, along that path, I discovered Paul Hawken, Hunter Levins, who's become a really dear friend and a colleague, um, who, you know, really took me deep inside. If you want to change the system, I mean, the economy is eating the planet whole. We've allowed that to happen. And we've allowed it to happen with our pensions and our credit cards and our bank accounts and our own investments. We're all touching that economy that is eating the planet whole. And so if we want to reshape the world, we need to put our hands and our hearts and our values on the economy. And so, you know, in this next kind of iteration of my life where I'm shifting from activist to entrepreneur to investor, um, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about the opportunity to align people with their money and move money. Move it Monday. <laughs> move the money, 100% of it. I was, so, I was so excited by the panel yesterday on 100%. You know, the, the idea that people are taking all of their assets, every single piece of who they are financially in the world and aligning it with what they love. Um, I think that's what we need to do. I, I think we fundamentally need to uh, restructure the economy and that it's not going to be governments that does that restructuring. If we're all waiting for our governments to wake up and restructure the economy to align it with social justice, with ending global poverty, with abating climate change, with restoring the right, the, the absolute intrinsic right of indigenous people to exist and thrive in the world, if we think governments are gonna do that, we're missing it. It's us. Thank you, Donna. We have our new friend, our, uh, Robert Gomez, who's new to SOCAP this year. He's an artist and an activist, and I'd love for you to, to tell the folks gathered here and who are watching us live streaming about the, the, some of your history and how you got to this point. Yeah, so I'm a social documentary filmmaker and photographer. I think we have a, a similar story of you know, having our immigrant past really um, affecting the way that we are. So my family is from Mexico, but I was born in the United States. And I grew up knowing that the world was unfair. You know, I could have intense privilege in the United States, attend a nice private school, and then go to Mexico and live in the very rural extreme poverty that my family was in. And so seeing that injustice, I also felt a sense of privilege being able to go across borders. And there, I started to realize that I had an obligation to make the world better. And growing up, I always felt that I was going to make the world better by either doing something very difficult, be overcoming challenges, or I was going to do it creatively. I was going to create beauty in the world. And so leaving high school, I entered the United States Military Academy at West Point, you know, training to be a military officer, choosing to make my stand with weapons. And it was a really powerful experience because the first month that I was there, two planes flew into the World Trade Center. And every soldier there had to very directly come to terms with what the value of their life was. You know, you realize at that moment that you only have one life to give. You know, that, that's all you can do. And so, you know, a lot of us went through a lot of different difficult conversations about what it is that we're going to do, and we all felt very righteous in being part of the military and being part of something that was just. 
And right around that time, one quote that really stuck with me you know, in this kind of soul searching and questioning of what my life was worth was a quote by General Patton, um, you know, who told this to his soldiers in World War II. Um, and he said very famously um, that, I don't want you to die for your country. I want you to make the other poor bastard die for his country. And there's something really powerful there, and I think this kind of flips the question of what we're talking about, you know, what would you die for, is that the kind of answer to that was that you, the ultimate sacrifice doesn't have to mean taking a bullet. It doesn't have to mean dying. The ultimate sacrifice can be something active. You know, where you are really dedicating your life is almost more of a challenge. You know, dedicating your, dedicating your life to something good, working hard for something positive, that activism can be more powerful than actually dying for something. And so, you know, in that moment, I started to realize that I wanted to be able to create more. You know, I didn't want to just traffic in life and death, you know, which would have been the path if I stayed there. And so I, I left West Point and I started to enter into social documentary photography in areas of conflict. And so working in places where people are very much uh, struggling for their rights to survive um, in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, in you know, Mexico with drug cartels, um, being able to go there and work with people that are trying to make their lives better through art. And so I'd go and work with these people that are very, um, very powerful, very engaging, and be able to make work that tells that story to a broader audience to hopefully stop those bullets from flying in the future. Um, so that's, that's how I got to this point. Thank you. As I sit here and listen to each one of you tell these stories, filmmaker, financier, tech genius, you know, these labels kind of come to my mind. And, and I want to go back to Primal and, and start with you again. I cannot imagine that anyone have, would have ever said this directly to you, but do you ever feel this sense of, you know, people think you, you'd be able to make so much money if you'd just move a little bit farther south down, you know, to Sil Silicon Valley and apply what you were doing at Kiva to something that could really make a fortune for you. And I'm just wondering how, what it is about Kiva, what it is about what you're doing right now that is so compelling that, ha that you find yourself there rather than doing what this culture is just wants to launch us into doing. Talk to me about Kiva. <clears throat> well, it's, I mean, it's, it's such a privilege to have, um, you know, work aligned with your purpose um, that, uh, you know, you, you, if you can live sustainably and work um, in a way that benefits others, I, I, you know, thinking about death as part of this panel, and I read, <laughs> I'd read actually this quote uh, that if everything you do, you do for yourself, then when you die, it all disappears. And if everything you do, you do for others, then when you die, it lives on. And so it's almost the most selfish thing to do wow. is to actually work for the benefit of others. To, to actually, um, you know, you can't eat money, you can't take it with you, um, and uh, it's just a, I think being able to, you know, like all of us are doing, create beauty, and like all, this whole group is doing, I mean, just meet brothers and sisters here who are doing in their own way something that is completely led by passion. We've come alive in our lives in a way that I think inspire other people, and I know we feel lucky. So regardless of the, the small sacrifices or the minor inconveniences, it is just an incredible privilege. And I think that's, that's something that um, you know, I'm reminded of um, when, I, uh, when I go to work every day. Thank you. Donna, it's kind of hard to ask you that question after you tell us you were arrested every five weeks from the time <laughs> you were 20, because you've never been tempted. Oh, I've been tempted. I mean, okay. I've had, some, I've had some, some sort of stratospheric job offers throughout my life. And it sort of went like this. Someone would call me and say, there's this job, this supposedly really great job, and we want to interview you. 
And this voice inside just said, oh no. <laughs> just, it was just, it, it's easy, which is what I was saying. I, maybe there's a missing hemisphere in my brain. Maybe there's <laughs> sort of missing uh, compartmentalization facets of, of some people's brains that I don't possess. But I, I don't have it. I mean, I never took the big fat job and then went, oh my God, I don't have any purpose. I just, I'm not wired that way. Um, and so I've had this utter privilege of doing what I love. And, and sometimes there really wasn't any money. <laughs> and that was really hard. Um, and, and hard still, like, you know, I, I started a, a clean tech company, a clean energy company that works with indigenous communities in Canada. Um, you know, I, I used all my own assets to start the company. And when it's been hard, it's really hard because I'm risking my kids' education. Um, but that's not as hard as people who have died <laughs> for what they believe in. And, and so when, when, you know, when the question comes about, I, I lost sleep over the question <laughs> of what would you literally die for? It, it woke me up in the middle of the night, <laughs> probably five times, including last night. Because um, <laughs> it's a really big, fat question. You know, if you take the question seriously, it's a really big question that I think should rattle around inside every part of our bodies. Um, but, you know, I've had this incredible privilege now to be in three different fellowship programs, Ashoka and Reasonable and the Ogunte Fellowship Program for Women in the UK. And in all of those programs, um, the, you know, my brothers and sisters in those programs Lots of them have risked their lives and continue to risk their lives every day doing the change work they do in Pakistan, in Liberia. Um, and you know, in the Ashoka program, I worked with a woman who was a former victim of torture who now helps people heal from the trauma of torture. I mean, I've never done anything like that. So what that I sat in a jail cell for 24 hours for Greenpeace, you know? Um, I've, I've had an incredibly privileged life. And, and so there's something about that question of what would we die for right. that I think does un unlock some degree of privilege. I mean, there's people who risk dying and die every day all over the world because of the messes that we're talking about, climate change and poverty and grotesque gaps between rich and poor, um, incredible rampant sexism. Um, it costs people their lives every day. And so I, I feel like as, you know, I have some indigenous heritage, but I have white skin privilege. And so I feel this enormous sense of obligation to speak because no one's going to shoot me <laughs> for shooting my mouth off, you know? <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of activists in Canada, uh, native activists, environmental activists who have been audited by the government of Canada. Every Ashoka fellow that does environmental work in Canada right now has been audited by the government and sat in rooms with lights in your face where they ask you questions about everything you said and everything you tweeted and everything you've thought your whole life. But so what? <laughs> it was inconvenient. It was irritating. It, it upsets me that my government thinks that environmentalists are enemies of the state. We're actually now classed with the Ku Klux Klan as extreme terrorists. It's hideous, it's wrong, it's messed up, it's broken, but no one's gonna shoot me, I hope, for saying what I'm <laughs> saying right now. So I feel this big, fat obligation to say it, to really, really give it and show up and say it. Thank you. Okay, so Robert. You're really just going into these scary places to shoot documentary <laughs> films, to get attention, so some Hollywood producer is going to notice your <laughs> abilities, and you're going to get all the way to, you know, you're going to become a big, famous filmmaker. That's right, isn't it? That's, That's why you're absolutely, doing it. Absolutely. I, I, I thought you might want to talk to us about that a little bit. So I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, the social documentary as, as being a, a field, but also talking about using that privilege with people that are literally risking their lives to be who they are. Right. So the, the second, um, one of my last projects that I did was um, 
a photography workshop in Mexico, in, in, in Juarez, Mexico. And Juarez, Mexico is actually the most violent city in the world for the past several years. Tens of thousands of people being murdered. Um, and I went down to work with orphans of murdered and disappeared women. And this is an organization where kids' mothers are, are found in several pieces. You know, they disappear for two weeks, and then they're found cut up on, um, you know, in front of the police station. Um, one of the kids that I work with, her sister disappeared seven years ago, and they found her in, in, a, in a concrete barrel. And through forensics, they, do, they realized that she had been professionally tortured for several days. And here was this group of kids that was trying to have fun, trying to learn how to color with crayons. And I went down um, with cameras. And what my purpose was, was to be able to try and give some type of self-expression. Um, be able to give them a, a way to be able to hold the reality that they did have, the precious little family they could still hold on to. And so what we did is we got to take family portraits, and they took, fam they had to redefine their family quite literally um, with their cousin instead of their mother or their aunt instead of their sister. Um, one group of kids, they lost their mother 10 years ago, and they took a portrait with their, with their grandmother. And two, two weeks after I left, the grandmother was taking them to school, and, and somebody jumped out of a truck and shot her five times, one time, two times in the shoulders and three times in the chest. And her 12-year-old and 13-year-old grandchildren were present. And it's very hard for me to imagine you know, putting myself in their shoes thinking of what I would do if I were a 12-year-old. You know, would I run to save my grandmother? Mm -hmm. Or would I run to save myself? Mm -hmm. It's an extremely difficult situation to be in. And so I think that in terms of the privilege that I have, I can go and I can leave. But these people that I work with, they're very much entrenched in trying to do what they can to survive. And it's very, very powerful. You know, the, the, the photographs aren't gonna sell tens and thousands of dollars. You know, I have their little kind of family portrait before the shooting um, in my home. But what it is gonna do, it's gonna help give them a sense of purpose, it helps allow them to, to, to be able to show to the world that they, they do exist, right? And so they were in small publications there. Um, they have their own prints. And so that's something that I think is really beautiful about photography. It's not necessarily gonna make you know, millions of dollars. It doesn't make large salaries, but what it does is it allows people that participate in it to validate their own lives. They saw themselves as photographers. They got to see themselves as a family. And it also allows other people to hear those stories. And so that's something that I think is, is, is really quite powerful in the work that I do. I think I get more out of it not necessarily financially, um, but I get more out of it personally, and it's much more inspiring than I could ever imagine. Thank you. I want to jump back to something that Donna was saying a few minutes ago about going all in and how hard it is in this world to go all in. And uh, Bill, I think you'll appreciate uh, this anecdote I'm going to tell. Sometimes Kev people will ask Kevin and me what it is we do, and we tell them about Good Capital and The Hub and and SOCAP, and they say, oh, you're doing such great work. And I always, uh, I come back usually with, yes, but we fly all over the world, so we have carbon offsets to offset the good work we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of happens to all of us, where there, there are these compromises or choices that maybe aren't even compromises, that we just have to make those places work, and we can't go all in. And I wondered if we could start with you, Bill, to talk about how do you deal with those pieces of your life where you, you have to or you just simply must compromise? And, and thank you for saying that you wanted to Skype instead of fly here. We really appreciate that, although we would have loved to have had you here all week. Well, you know, I, I do all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm, uh, when I'm at home, I'm, environmental uh, virtues at, at solar panel place and I wrote the first hybrid electric word in Vermont 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I've been here on Earth in the last five months trying to build God of Earth. Hang on just a second, Bill. Do we, can we get... That's the best we can do, Bjorn? Yeah. Okay, we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. So tr let's try it again. I was hearing enough of it to keep... to have no. you continue to answer. Just to say, uh, we're not going to solve the climate crisis by one light bulb at a time. We're going to solve it politically if we're going to solve it. And that means that we need to go out and do the work of organizing and all that. So I, I just, you know, am cognizant of the fact that uh, I'm a hypocrite in those ways, and then I get on with the work. Yeah. Primal, what about you? What are those places that you feel like you just have to make a different choice sometimes? Yeah, I'm, you know, related to what Bill said, uh, Peter Singer uh, is a hero of mine. He's an ethicist, um, uh, and he, he, he basically looks at the planet, and he says, all right, if you live in the United States, well, let me start back. And it, it, he does a thought experiment, first of all. He says, say you're driving your brand new car that you just pulled off a lot, and uh, of, of, you just bought it, and uh, you're on a train track, and your car stalls. And what do you know? You look to your right, and a train is coming towards you. And you look to your left, and there's an eight-year-old child try, tied to the track. In that moment, what would you do? And if you ask, I'd like to believe 99% of Americans would say, I've, I've get out of the car, because, and you, could, you only have time to do one of two things, push your car off the track, save your car, or save the child. What would you do? Well, 99% of Americans, I believe, would get out of their car, untie that eight-year-old child, and save the child. And he goes from that thought experiment saying, well, if you're willing to let go of a car, and you know that 25,000 children a day die from preventable diseases, why isn't every American basically taking any amount of discretionary income that they don't need to absolutely survive? Right. And basically investing in things like deworming children, things that are just preventable, uh, that, that could really prevent deaths. Um, and, you know, social scientists have looked at this thought experiment. They've later said, well, oftentimes what's happening is that the child is not right next to you, but it's thousands of miles away, which is why at Kiva, what we're trying to do is make the problem much more human scale so you can actually see people, not from a frame of pity, but from a frame of being able to be a business partner with them and framed in hope and entrepreneurship. But going back to kind of the hypocrite kind of sentiment that I have of, I don't actually give away everything that I have uh, beyond that. And I, I've been wrestling with Peter Singer's thought experiment a lot. And, you know, if any of you guys have ways that you've kind of transcended that, uh, Bill, I like what you had to say that, you know, turning, living in the dark is not going to solve, in, in your home, is not going to solve the climate crisis. You're going to have to find bigger lever points and be imperfect and go on with your work. That was helpful. But I do struggle with that thought experiment. Donna? Um, well, you know, one of the, one of the ironies um, of the last sort of five years of my life is that in order to work with indigenous communities in Canada on renewable energy, I had to get a driver's license because <laughs> you can't get there <laughs> by mass transit. I grew up in big cities. I was a non-driver, almost a religious non-driver my whole life, no driver's license. Um, and then all of a sudden, I was going out to these remote communities with no way to get there but driving. Um, but I, you know, I felt like we're helping communities own their energy, we're helping communities discover the relationships between art and energy, which is one of the things we did. We, we helped communities put art onto solar panels as a way of saying this is who we are, that we have ancestors that have lived on this planet sustainably for 10,000 years. And now we're going to make a statement about the integration of who we are as beings and our culture and this new technology that allows us to provide for the future. Um, and so it felt like, okay, I, I could live with that set of compromises. Um, 
Uh, and, and now, you know, I'm moving from the entrepreneurial space into the investor space, which feels, you know, complex. You know, I'm moving full tilt into the world of money. You know, I've done policy. I, I fought for carbon taxes for 10 years, which is another story. Uh, talk to me about that some other time. Maybe, Bill, we should talk about that. Um, but, you know, now I'm, I'm in the, the sort of the center of, of the financial world. Um, but the, the prospect of helping people, you know, do really deep value dives into who are you, what do you love, how do you line up your money with everything you are, how do you take the most powerful expression of who you are as a human being, your money in the world, and line it up with everything you hold sacred, right? That feels really right. It feels really complicated, it feels really complex, it feels like it's gonna be really hard, but it feels really right to hold people through that journey, to really move the money, because we need to move the money. Monday, right? <laughs> we need to move all the money Monday. Thank you. Robert, where would you like to go bigger, deeper, broader than you're you've been able to imagine going yet? That's a really, really important question. Um, I think there's, there's a very tense challenge with, with the work that I do because I work with people that are vulnerable in a lot of ways. And so to bring more exposure to their stories in some ways can make them even more vulnerable, mm. can put even more danger in their lives. And I'll give an example. Um, I was in Jamaica recently working as the filmmaker for the first uh, international social media campaign for gay rights in Jamaica. And Jamaica is actually the most homophobic country in the Western Hemisphere. And what that means, there's a law on the books that criminalizes homosexual acts, uh, and it's punishable by, by up to 10 years in prison. And so that really filters down to a very strict cultural intolerance. And when I was there, um, you know, I was interviewing um, individuals uh, in the LGBTQ community, and two miles away from where I was staying, there was a teenager, a transgender teenager, that was beaten to death by a mob. And I got to interview her surviving roommates, who were also transgender, who were also at the party, and they told an incredibly moving story of how beautiful um, the gully queen was, you know, this transgender person that was murdered. Um, but they also told about how horrific the event was. There wasn't just a mob beating the, um, the gully queen, you know, this transgender girl was also disemboweled, was also run over, and was also shot three times. And so it was a very tough place to be able to try and celebrate this person um, through her roommate's stories, who are also transgender, who want to take risks to be able to be who they are, who want to take risks to be able to love, um, and told their stories openly and, and sang songs for us and, uh, you know, put on their makeup and they, and they, they became their, who they wanted to be. And so me thinking about creating that into a feature-length film, be able to see all, seen all across the world, actually puts them in a very real danger of losing their lives. And so that's something that I'm really constantly struggling with, is how big do these projects actually have to be? Are they just for the LGBTQ community who can see that and, and they'll be able to tell those stories and they'll be able to kind of have this type of solidarity? Or is it important for me to be able to tell everyone, you know, even the people that, you know, the members in the mob, you know, because nobody has been found, nobody has, has any charges against them, but a mob means that dozens of people committed this murder. You know, being able to tell them of the humanity of these transgender people. Um, so that's kind of the tough point of, does, do you want the whole world to see it or do you select your audiences? And I think that's, that's something that I'm really starting to, to kind of struggle with. Um, but I think first and foremost, it's for the community that I work with to be able to celebrate their resilience, to be able to tell those stories. And then it's also to select audiences on the outside to be able to have some type of personal investment into what's happening on the ground there. Thank you so much. You all have talked about being anxious about uh, what would you die for in this panel, and I, 
I have to tell y'all, I was not anxious about this panel at all because these stories, these four people are doing such amazing work and are, all of you are heroes of mine. And I'm so privileged to be here and be able to chat with you. I see Cheyenne sitting there with a microphone and I want to turn now and see what questions you might have for these, this group of people. Laura Darling. It has been a privilege um, hearing your stories. I was a Kiva fellow in Uganda a few years ago, and one of the things that that really did for me was to, to recognize I am never, even if I gave away all my money, I'm never going to be as poor as some of these people. Yeah. And so one of the things that I heard you talking about touching on was on privilege. Could you talk about how you manage that and how you hold that privilege, recognizing it, acknowledging it, and, and working with it to, to do the work that you do without being overcome by it? Thank you. Maybe I can start off. I think part of it is just growing up between Mexico and the United States. Recognizing my privileges in to being an American is not necessarily being better, but recognizing that there's a lot of equal worth with the, the stories and what you can learn from those people. So I feel like it's, even though there, I have an economic privilege, I have a political privilege in being able to move, I don't think that makes me better, right? That there's a very, as much as I can give, they can give to me and I can learn. And so I think that's a way of not really trying to be patronizing, not being a benefactor and, and being the supreme power that can change the world, but acknowledging that it's an exchange uh, between two forces that are really um, invested with with each other. So I think that's kind of, for me, how it works. Um, there, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people in Canada that have some Aboriginal heritage. Um, some people are raised deep in the culture. Some people uh, are estranged from the culture. I was really raised by my European family. So getting to work with First Nations communities over the last sort of seven to 10 years has been um, really important for me. Um, as a being, um, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have elders that mentored me in my childhood, but I've been sort of taken under wing by 40, 50 elders over the last few years um, who sort of said, you got to learn stuff. Like, yeah, it's great, that you, it's great that you went to university, honey. Cool. Awesome. You, you've got some smart stuff that you can teach us. We want it. But you got to learn some stuff. And so they took me into ceremony. They, you know, took me into the woods. There's a, there's a guy who really wants to take me hunting because he knows about my Greenpeace history, um, which I'm gearing up for, my first moose hunt. Um, not quite ready yet. Um, but, you know, I, I've learned... I've learned really profound things. You know, I have learned from people who are not just attached to the land, they are the land. <laughs> the land is who they are. Um, and, and I started to understand that much more profoundly. Um, that, you know, the, the idea of art and culture and who people are being interwoven I understand it really differently. There's a, there's a quote from a, um, a Métis radical rebel philosopher who was hung by the Canadian government, um, a man named Louis Riel, who said a lot of really amazing things. You want to Google him. He's a really wise guy. But one of the big quotes that really changed my life is Louis Riel said, my people will sleep for 100 years, and when they wake up, it's the artists that will give them their spirit back. And I really believe that. I, I think that is part of where we are in this moment in time, mm -hmm. that we need art, we need yeah. artists, we need people to show us a new way of being. We need storytellers, we need dancers. We, we need to remember that we're creatures of spirit and soul and that we're cellularly tied to this living world, that all of us have indigenous heritage, all of us, not just people that have North American indigenous blood, or South American indigenous blood, or Indian blood. Every human being has the cells in their body that we inherited from our ancestors that is ancient knowledge about how to live. And we have to remember, we have to wake up those parts of our brain that, that know that you can't pee in the drinking water. <laughs> the parts of our brain that know that we are connected to the animals and that what we do in the world and the messes we create comes back to us. 
you know? We, we need to find that part. I, I've met some amazing indigenous Scots over the last few years that are really trying to re-indigenize um, Scotland. Um, elders who take that on really seriously, they're learning Gaelic, they're learning traditional ways of being in the world, and they're, you know, they're snowy white people with a beautiful sense of ind indigeneity, of, of mm. not modernizing indigenous people, but indigenizing the modern economy. And, and I believe that that's the gift of this time. We can, we can really learn from each other. We can, we can learn from people all over the world through social media. Indigenous people are strongly speaking through Twitter and Facebook, and we can gather their voices and the things they know about how to live in the world, and, and we can make dramatic changes through that wisdom. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Oh, yes. Is that Lewis? Um, yes. <laughs> I'm Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of thoughts, and I think to your last comment, Donna, um, the artists are there. You have woken up, um, and, and you are inspiring each one of the audience that is hearing your stories. So thank you for that first. Um, the, the question that I wanted to ask is, in one of the panels, uh, and I think Penelope Douglas uh, asked the panelist about what would you um, have SOCAP to be accountable for? Mm -hmm. And sort of taking a stab into that question, um, asking you what would you like to see um, in order for at least this audience to be more engaged in the work that you do? How can we be part of each one of your stories and help you guys maybe with this or maybe with this, but um, really engaging in the work that you do? That's, that's a great question. As I'm watching the clock tick down, I'm realizing that that's probably the last question we're going to get to take. And so I would like to say, why don't we make that the closing question? You know, what would you like, what would each of you, Bill, Primal, Robert, Donna, what would you like to challenge this group of people to what step to take next? Where to head? Let's start. Uh, Bill? Uh, I have to go anyways. Let me just say, um, you know, you don't, we don't need to go to jail right away. Um, <laughs> that, that's good. Um, if you belong to anything that invest money in anything, uh, get it the hell out of fossil fuels right now. It's a rogue industry. Thank you, Bill. And I know you have to go on and leave, leave us, but we'll, we'll stay and have these Thank three folks on coming. stage. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Brimmel? Well, um, you know, I, I'd flip it back and say that uh, at Kiva, one thing we're really fascinated by is how we can help all of you. And I would say the subset of you who are social entrepreneurs here looking for capital. Um, we uh, have historically uh, only worked with microfinance institutions and now have opened up the platform to social enterprises of all types. And I know that uh, it can be really, really hard to fight the two-front war of doing incredible work with your intervention uh, and then also trying to raise money for it. And it can, uh, we're, 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 we're very open to how this platform, how the Kiva community that's raising about a million dollars every three days can help put more good things into the world, uh, make the markets work better for, for everyone on the planet. And that's the one thing that I wanted to uh, invite anyone uh, who, who is looking for that funding to, to get in touch with us at Kiva because we're, we're starting to open it up to all social enterprises. Right. Robert, what's the step you want us to take? So I can, I think the, the, the step that I want to mention is all of us know a lot of local artists, and I think part of it is to be able to empower those people at the grassroots level, you know, to be able to invest in them in whatever way it is, either giving support or going to shows or whatever else. But I think the kind of the underlying question that for me in, in thinking about what I would literally die for is to kind of flip it to you is, is to really think about you know, what does that your life mean? You know, what would you live for? That's the underlying question. 
You know, and to be able to really live fully and passionately, I think is the most important thing to be able to take out of that question because everybody knows they're gonna die. Um, but it's what you do with your life that's really important. So I think, just to think about that question, what are we prepared to live for? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I have a friend who's a, a Darwin scholar who likes to talk about how people got it really wrong when they think that Darwinism was about competition, that he actually wrote a lot about collaboration. And so, you know, one of the things moving into the investment space that really um, excites me is the opportunity to flip it and do it really differently and to out-collaborate conventional investment. I mean, I, I think we can do that. I think this community can do that. I think we have to do that, though, going back to Luis's sort of question, by being really concrete, that it is really about metrics and impact. I think, I think there is probably a way that we could collaborate across platforms in this space to really get clear about how many lives did we save, how many girls did we educate, how much CO2 did we take out of the world as a community, and that we could build dashboards and tools. I mean, we're talking, Principium is talking with some folks about how to do that. But I think we should share that. I think it shouldn't be ours. I think it should be ours. I think this, this, this community, this highly wanting to collaborate community, we need to get really clear about what we mean by impact. And impact is not intention, and impact is not policies, and impact is not grandiose statements about how clean and green and CSR we are. Impact is about did you change lives? Did you make the world better? Did you take pollution out and make it more possible for future generations to build a life? And so I, I would love to see SOCAP move into not just convening about impact and talking about impact, but making it possible for us to get really, really clean and clear and precise and measured. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to each one of you uh, for being here. It's, I, I can't believe I get to do things, <laughs> like sit on the stage with folks like you and hear the passionate stories that you have and to kind of bask in some reflected mm -hmm. glory of bringing your stories to light. It's so amazing to me. Each, thank you to each one of you for what you're doing. And we will, uh, we have just a little bit more time here together and I'm looking forward to, to seeing how the rest of the day turns out. So break time. Let's, let's go to the Impact Hub. Thank you.